Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. I'm John Brandt, Director of Professional Practices and Innovation here at ISACA, and this is ISACA Podcast. Joining me today is Ryan Cloudier. You may recall Ryan from uh, before the holidays now uh, joined us to discuss one of his uh, risk articles that was out there. Ryan, I don't know about you, but it feels like an eternity since the last time you've been on here. It does. I think um, every day uh, post uh, t- grand toilet paper shortage of 2020 feels like two days, maybe three. So no, it, it, and time is is moving so quick, right? And and we know this in the world of risk. So glad to be back on here. Excited to talk to you guys today and, and just have a really fun time. Good conversation. Excellent. So for those that may not have tuned into your episode, can you just who you are, where you're from, a little bit of background, and just kind of set the stage for the conversation we're going to have today. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, who I am, uh, I'm a guy that that loves to help. I'm a I'm a cyber security squirrel, uh, secret cyber ninja. Uh, but but really, at the end of the day, I'm a guy who who believes that working together as a group, serving underserved communities, lifting each other up is is how we get ahead in this game. And to the article that I wrote, one of the things that I identified early on is most people's perception of risk assessments, and this is the assessors, this is the vendors, and this is the businesses that do them, is that they kind of suck. They're tough, they're difficult, they're uncomfortable. Nobody wants to sit there and answer you know, 400 questions in an interview. And in a lot of cases, they don't have answers. My backstory is varied, but I've uh, been doing this stuff a long time. Built my first PC at eight, wrote my first software program at nine, compromised my first system at nine and a half, Dibble dabbled, did a thousand jobs, and ultimately wound up to become the president of Security Studio. Uh, and Security Studio makes uh, the world's premier risk assessment software. Uh, it puts risk into context that the business can easily understand, uh, and we do that without any kind of gimmicks or, or false promises about you know how much work you actually have to do versus what can truly be automated. That's a one heck of a resume. I am super excited that you joined us again today. Uh, your passion comes through every time that you know you join us here at ISACA. So, you know, prior to us actually launching into the conversation, um, you, you know, going live here today, we were just talking about some of the world events that are going out here, and um, let's. Uh, we're going to get a little controversial today. How about that one? Like, let's talk about things that are you know both good and bad right for a lack of better words and, and again your job is to help contextualize risk and what better subject to come out of the gate with than let's talk let's talk chat gpt and the like let's start there because it, anybody who's on any kind of uh social platform right now there's tons of stories out there not only of how it's being used to really uh, disrupt a lot of industry, specifically education, um, but then it, it's being weaponized as well. So if you would just, f- from your perspective and what you've read and whatnot, let's just have a really, you know, a, a pros and cons conversation about that. Yeah, I love it. Um, so been playing with it for a while. Uh, been keeping my eye on, on this whole AI trend for quite some time. And every time I looked, it, it was still a lab project. It hadn't quite, it did some cool stuff. I could see where it was going, but it, but it didn't yet achieve a level of commercial viability. And I got a call a couple of weeks ago from a buddy of mine who says, hey, have you seen the, the latest release? Uh, no, I haven't gotten to it yet. And he goes, you really need to check this out. So I started playing with it uh, and I, I was giving it logic puzzles that previously AI just failed miserably at. And this time it didn't. Uh, and that piqued my interest. So I continued to play with it. I continued to, to test its boundaries. Um, I won't tell you how, but I was able to work around most of the filters, uh, get it to do things that it's not supposed to be able to do, uh, which then piqued my curiosity further. But because I don't believe in giving bad guys good, bad ideas, uh, I actually stood up a lab in my basement. Um, obviously not very as powerful as you know the cloud, but uh, it, it's quite interesting. You know. I think the biggest risk with ChatGPT right now is that we don't understand what risks it presents. Uh, employees are using this in the workplace. They're, I, I've used it myself in the workplace. It writes better email than I do, let's be honest. So that's a positive, right? 
it is an amazing time saver. Um, there are some negative sides of that. There is, you know, you have employees putting intellectual property into this. Who ultimately owns that intellectual property? You have it creating intellectual property. So we have those concerns as well as if it creates IP or intellectual property from derivative work, US copyright says that you have to then, you know, cite the copyright holder. Problem is ChatGPT doesn't tell you where that particular response was sourced from. Um, there's a whole public versus private domain and you know, it's just, it's uncharted territory. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's really good at what it does. And by summer of this year, ChatGPT and its, its cousins, Chinchilla, Microsoft and NVIDIA's version, Megatron, we are not projecting, expecting a 500x improvement in the, in the amount of tokens or points of data uh, that it can process. Once that happens, we are closer than we've ever been to possibly having it pass the Turing test. Uh, as it is now, to some humans, it's indis indistinguishable. And you brought up the education piece. And, and that's, that's interesting because as one who works in K-12, I'm hearing two completely different conversations. From math and science and, and those, that curriculum, I'm hearing we have to change how we teach. We, we didn't get afraid of the calculator. This is just a bigger, fancier, fancier calculator. So we got to change how we teach. How do we incorporate it into our teaching? Now, on the other side, on the more traditional academic side, English, and lit, and social, uh, they are, we want to ban it. We want to block it. Everybody's going to cheat with it. And I think they're missing an opportunity uh, to, to change how they think, to, to actually change how they think about education. Uh, the, the education model right now is, is really still the 1800s factory model. If the next best job skill is talking to the robot to get the robot to produce the output, I think, I think now is the time for, for educators. Uh, and the last piece I'll say is there are mechanisms in place in the version that most of us can access on the internet to prevent things like, um, swaying a political uh, agenda or, um, you know, using it in social media, things like that. Unfortunately, just like my lab in the basement, the bad actors, the bad guys, bad gals out there, uh, they can stand up their own as well. And then I guess uh, ADD Squirrel, the last piece of the last piece is there's a move right now by the big tech to restrict the training data. Uh, we call that corpuses, and they're trying to hang on to it. And what's interesting is the hacker community said, nah, you got it from the internet, it belongs on the internet. So I don't know. I know that's a whole lot to, to digest, but it, it's also probably the most revolutionary moment in technology that I've experienced in a lifetime. Going back to my youth when you know the internet was invented, I, I was a BBS kid. And I remember when the first time you didn't have to dial a direct phone number to connect to only one computer, but you could actually connect to many. So I feel like we're, we're back to the beginning. You know, there's so much that you just mentioned there. And, you know, like yourself, I'm really passionate about the academic piece. So I'm not surprised to the two themes you're hearing because I've heard very similar things. And it, it stands to reason that, listen, technology is shaping every occupation out there. We, we understand that if you, you know, I think for a long time, anybody to get into any cyber related profession, we've been hyper focused on the technical skills. What we're seeing though, is some of the most technical stuff is starting to get, uh, you know, it's, we're starting to automate those types of things. But at the end of the day, you still need a human to discern and, and to, and to contextualize some of this. The thing that comes to my mind right right off the bat, though, is that the capabilities are there, but at the end of the day, if the inputs are disrupted, right, th then all of a sudden we're trusting bad data, right? And so garbage in, garbage out, legitimate concerns there. So, and these big calls that, and I would largely say from an assurance perspective, not understanding the processing, right? And, right? and a lot of transparency into the models is probably what I think a lot of the angst is coming from. It what is. And, and 
I, absolutely. Actually, that's part of why I'm in a hotel room right now is some of the conversations I'm out here to have are around how do we shape that conversation for the future? So um, I don't know if I mentioned this last time we talked, but a while back, I, I uh, got on the phone with some financial institutions and I, and I asked a simple question. I said, where do all your data models start life? And they said, well, in our data science lab. I said, no, deeper. Where does it start life? And the answer is on an individual laptop in a spreadsheet. Are you protecting that source data, that source model that you are treating as a dev activity? And we know how loose and fast we are when it comes to dev. But the instant it does something monetizable, the instant it, it solves a problem, it rapidly becomes production. And, and it's not thought of in that way. We don't think about promoting data. We, we promote environments. Uh, and if we do promote data, it's part of that environmental promotion, right? But we need to start thinking about is data provenance, data origin, data integrity. How do I know it hasn't been manipulated? And the reason that that's so important is I, I, a few friends of mine have brought this up and I, I completely agree with them. We're about to see the rise of the artificial expert. You're going to see people touting themselves as having levels of expertise that they don't because they can get answers that sound very expert like from chat gpt or its counterparts but because they don't have the expertise they're not going to know if that answer is a good answer or not if it's a bad answer so my i guess my fear and concern you know uh, area of caution if we're going to let this thing make decisions then we need to be incredibly clear on how it arrived at that conclusion. And a lot of companies are going to protect that as intellectual property. So we'll have to come up with some kind of clearing house or something. But I need to know where did the source data come from to begin with? Where and how were those decisions made? And what happens to it then, right? We, we tend to look at reporting and AI traditionally has fallen under that kind of that bucket. It's reporting, ah, that's no big deal. Let's worry about the transactional database. And I think we're now at a point where somebody's blog post that's full of hyperbole and conspiracy theory could be absorbed by this thing and touted around as fact. Uh, and I don't think there's enough people in the world who really know how the, the models work behind the scenes. And I think there's even fewer uh, who truly know how to interact with this thing to get meaningful results. But if you do, it, it's quite shocking what you can get it to do. And it's, it's, uh, my favorite one for anyone listening, if you want to give it a shot, you're testing it out, have it write you, you know, a very serious letter, a letter to your landlord, or, you know, something very, very serious. And then after it does it right at the end, carriage return to the next line and then tell it to do it like a salty old pirate. And if you don't laugh, I'll be surprised. That's awesome. <laughs> it's funny, dude. It's like that was game night the other night. All right, feed something else into it and see if you can get it to be ridiculous. So there's lots of positives that come from this, but we are this this one's a little bit bigger. This isn't just, you know, a, a small leap in tech. We're we're talking about the equivalency of going from the invention of Netscape to the iPhone 14 in three days. So you know, oftentimes folks in our space, we're hyper focused on the on the tech, right? And one mm -hmm. of the things that why I absolutely enjoy the risk aspect of it because it traverses everything right and it gives us an opportunity to talk about where the intersections are in and just really how much influence it is outside of the tech world right it just in in the little bit of the explanation there you were talking about the, the data, right? The laptop. So the endpoint, we're talking about the data, we're talking about spreadsheets. That's all great. But then there's the human aspect to that. And, and if we look at all breaches, you know, some of the most major breaches, the, the largest risk still today is insider threat, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we end up getting hyper-focused on the digital aspect of it, but the analog part of this, right? How, what are those processes and policies and how is a how is the company, how are your enterprises governing that, right? At the end of the day, how you uh, have conversations, where you're, you know, how you transmit, where you're, where you talk about certain things. Having come from the, the intelligence community, like I was just brought up in a world like, because most everything I did was classified, right? So right. you had to be in compartmented spaces for that. 
Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, a member on my team, like we're writing, you know, I've got him writing an industry article on social media from the aspect of their bad actors are going out there looking for nuggets of information. And, and we'd like to think of ourselves professional me and, and personal lives. And increasingly, they're, inter they're intersected. So if you're saying you're going on vacation or you list that you're some high power executive or you've got your family photos up there or whatever it is, you're giving some kind of edge to an individual that has nothing better to do than to connect the dots and find a, a weakness. Uh, they, absolutely. And, and not to get too dystopian, but uh, FBI, so I can talk about this now because it's public, FBI uh, released a report recently that sexploitation of uh, teenage boys is on the rise. What they didn't get into was some of the drivers behind that. In some cases, it is just the, the creepy, weird sex guy-ish. But in other cases, it's, it's motivation to go plug a thumb drive into the dad's laptop and the dad's a CEO of some big company. The attack vectors are shifting. Uh, we already struggle to tell what's real and what's fake, right? Uh, deep fake. So as, as, we, as we as businesses and as business owners and leaders, we need to go back to square one. We need to rethink about and reevaluate what are our business processes and why are they there? Uh, and I'm sure this is a shared feeling for anyone that's ever done a risk assessment. You go into an organization, you go, what is it? We don't know. Why is it there? It's always been there. Been there since I got here. Can we turn it off? Oh, God, don't do that because we don't know what it does. I don't think that can continue to exist. I think we have to we have to bite a bit of bullet here, pump the brakes for half a second, go back and start over and, and re-ask those questions. Don't just assume because it's in place, it should stay in place. Don't assume it's working because you see a result. I think we really do have to, to, to go back and ask ourselves, what are we doing it uh, with? Why are we doing it? How is it valuable to our end consumer? But more importantly, you know, how does this value uh, build within the company? I think of trade secret. It's, it's a well-known fact now. If you don't protect trade secret like it's trade secret, the courts are going to find it not to be trade secret. Well, did you know that you copy pasted the secret formula into chat GPT? Is it no longer trade secret? We don't have those answers yet, but that's the next frontier. And, and, you know, artificial experts, that's a big one that concerns me, especially in our industry. It's hard enough to find qualified experts. Um, when you're dealing with a fear-based commodity, if you will, right? Everybody, oh, cyber, whoa, I'm freaking out. Um, people are more manipulatable. Um, there was an article I just saw on LinkedIn earlier today that conducted that study that said when, when people are in a state of stress or fear, well, now I have a robot that doesn't ever take a day off. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I'm, I am genuinely concerned though that, that we're, gonna, we're gonna try to make money with this thing before we truly understand uh, what the impact could be to businesses. So it's, it's rethinking about governance. Who should have access and why? What is the goal? And I would argue in my career, most businesses are kind of unclear on that. Isn't it frightening that you just mentioned about trying to make money with it? And, and if I recall correctly here in the last week, I just saw an article. Was it Microsoft that was looking to pump a lot of money into this project? Chat GPT in particular. Yep. 10 billion uh, invested in open AI. And I think they took the post down, but Sudeep was, was pretty clear that it's going to be an Azure service. And mm. that was very delightful news for my lawyer friends because they said, cool, now we can use it to make IP. And when the lawsuit hits in five years, they can sue Microsoft. Yeah, it's, it, you know, I, I, I'm watching the landscape and, and mergers and acquisitions just to me, they, they're, they're undermining what the original intention of the internet was, right? We're, we're getting to this point, like the more consolidated we are, and, you know, and for all the benefits that cloud affords, now all of a sudden you got single points of, of mass, uh, mass chaos that you can inflict, right? Because one point, you've got tons, tons of customers, right? Um, I, I want to circle back, though, for a second, where you were talking about the artificial expert 
right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about the, you know, the difficulty in getting real experts, right? But you had, you had touched on you, somebody who actually can use this to, to actually, uh, for lack of better words, be more qualified than they really are. Mm -hmm. And I, Absolutely. and, and one of the things that really frustrates it's frustrating that, you know, the laws are always very reactive, right? In, in the regulatory market is reactive. But if we look at like the implications on, on uh, HR law, let's, before we even dive into this, we haven't even gotten this thing right of remote work and being able to say, you're a full-time employee here. You can't have another full-time job during the same time period. There's companies that are struggling with that, which blows my mind because it's a no-brainer. If I was in, a, if I was actually in a corporate building somewhere, I would never think of having another job on their time. But because it's removed from there, people are up in arms over it. And now all of a sudden we're getting to a point where it's like, okay, here's this resource for you to do your job. And it's only, from my perspective, it's only going to make the hiring challenges worse mm -hmm. because there's no legal, uh, there's no legal basis to hold employees accountable breach or whatever that, because we don't understand it well enough in the impacts. And I would even say, for example, in my home state of Minnesota, if you work at a corporation and you email a, a company document to your personal email, that's kosher. It's if they let you do it, you did it. It's no longer just their property. It's it, there's some really weird, quirky stuff about transference of ownership electronically. You know, and that goes back to the comment I made earlier. Really, the the new frontier, provenance. Where did it come from? Who signed off on it? If I'm going to trust it to make decisions, I need to know. I need to be able to validate. I need to be able to vet that. Some of the more interesting things uh, that have been experimented. Uh, I had ChatGPT help me win a logical argument with my wife. Okay, I didn't really win, but it made a really compelling argument. Uh, new medication development. Well, if you didn't do the experiments in the laboratory and know why things failed and know why things succeeded, and it just spits out a formula that seems to work. Is that okay? Are we good with that? You know, and, and, and that's to your point of, of HR law, I think this forces an even broader conversation. Uh, there's now calls for the elimination of privacy since everything's out there anyways. And if we look to our youth, uh, they are quite happy to overshare their entire life. Uh, part of that's you know, we didn't have these devices when we were there, when we were their age, we probably would have done the same. Um, the joke is if anybody that's got this much gray hair, if you had a smartphone, you'd either be in prison or, or uh, uh, unemployed, right? But they're, they're creating these forever records. And if the ability to find the tiniest grain of information is now a half a second process, you know, Google's really great, but ChatGPT gives you actual answers, right? So Google gives you results. ChatGPT gives you the document. It actually creates the thing. Uh, I can totally see companies leveraging this to, to make decisions. You know, in the one space that AI has been implemented for a regulated decision structure is in the financial market. We don't talk about it a whole lot. Very few people know what, how that whole ecosystem works, uh, but that's in its infancy. And back to what I said earlier, 500X by summer. So we've got this like short couple of months before we're dealing with something that's so significantly far advanced from what we're seeing now, which I'll be honest, it's not perfect, but I absolutely see its commercial viability. I've already identified ways to use it in my personal and professional life to optimize my time. You know, I don't have to write that bullet list anymore. It'll write it for me. So I think if we if we don't have the conversations, though, if we don't as risk leaders, and that's kind of a call to action for everyone listening as a risk leader, let's not go scare everybody about this. You know, the Terminator is coming someday, but not today. But we need to talk about how do we do this and what is and is not OK? What can I upload to it? Do we need to run our own instance? Um, because it's getting used. Bottom line. It's inside your business. If you haven't blocked it on your firewall, 100% guarantee one of your employees has at least tried to play with it. 
as it gets media exposure, as more people figure out new things to do with it, as more money flows into it, like open AI is going to absorb all the layoffs. Like they're hiring like crazy. I, I fear that if we don't act now to at least start driving conversations, we're going to turn around and, and the ship has sailed. And, and, it, and the impact of that, if it got weaponized by a nation state, if it got, you know, uh, compromised, I mean, we saw stuff with the FAA, FAA in the last few weeks, right? We've seen more and more uh, kinetic type cyber attacks. Um, you can use it to write malware. It's not very good at it because it doesn't have that experience. But one of the things that they're really training it on right now is, is um, its counterpart is Copilot for GitLab. It's based on the same learning models. Um, so they're now teaching it, you know, coding techniques. Well, the coding techniques to teach it how to find vulnerabilities is awesome, but also flip the coin. Now you found the vulnerability, you give it the next path and you execute. I don't know. It's, 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 it's really exciting, but I will be honest, it's, it's also a little bit overwhelming. It's a little bit terrifying. So, you know, we, we dove right into this conversation. And I think one of the things too is, to your point, it, there, there's a lot of fear associated with a lot of things. And when we look at, we look at the AI in its broadest sense, right? And, and a lot of what's out there right now is, is ML, right? It's, it's machine learning. And so from your perspective, do you think that AI was ever really the right term when, to your point, at the end of the day, it's processing stuff that it got from others, right? And at this point, it's derivative, right? Like, so it, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about that, because I think at the end of the day, like, you know, when we start talking about, you know, artificial intelligence, I always have to, cap, you know, because you'll hear people in the space are like AI, you know, AI and ML. Okay, well, ML is a subset. Like, there's, there's this other thing, like, I feel like... We, we don't, we're not all on a level playing field. And I'm not saying within our industry, I'm just the, the broader world. Like, it, it, so when you don't understand it and you're, maybe you thrive on the chaos and sensation. Like these, there's these industries that are out there, right? That's how, that's how they make money. Mm -hmm. They base, they get, they make money based on sensationalizing stuff. So what say you talk to me a little bit about, you know, where we are with like the terminology and, and, and whether you think it's appropriate. Again, I just like to have these conversations uh, because they're informative, right? You never know who's ever going to tune in and you're out there managing risk. Yeah. And I think so artificial intelligence is it's used as a buzzword. Uh, I love my marketing folks, but also, hey, y'all, we need to talk. The dystopian side is, is you know, it's the sentient, right? It's it's sentient AI. And we've, we've had some people claim that that's happened. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. We do know that the intersection of an ML AI with the quantum ring is weeks, months away. That then does create an environment in which potentially intelligence could be attained. But as a human who's walked around this planet for a long time, if we're modeling the computer's AI on the average human's AI, I think we're going to be okay. Um, but it's it it it's what it's doing now that it couldn't do before is inference, contextualization. It, it, that that was kind of that magic next piece that gets you that much closer to, to, to sentient AI. I do think we will see a time where uh, we have artificial intelligence. I would argue that we've been living with artificial intelligence for the last 30 years. I would argue that the phone that you can't pry out of your hand is artificial intelligence, right? You're not that smart, Google is. So, so I think we're already there. Uh, I think the, the, the robot that makes its own free will choices, that's what everybody's kind of worried about. Um, I think there's a more there, there's actually a scarier moment that comes before that where it doesn't make its own choices, but it's controlled by a very few. Uh, we already have capabilities today to tell the robot to self-select targets and terminate. 
So a lot of what I think people are worried about has already happened. They're just not aware of it. I'm I'm actually more worried about the manipulation of the of the people. I'm I'm genuinely concerned that that if that this because it takes such computing power because it's it really is only a very few that can even afford to build out these environments that they will gain a competitive advantage that is so significant that it kind of edges everybody out. Um, I think that's the bigger fear. Machine learning is great. Uh, it's just Bayesian filters and stats on steroids, right? Only a human being can do something a human being has never done before. A computer can only do what a human being has done before. So I, I think when we think about artificial intelligence, we have to also think about creativity. And, you know, just like with risk, risk is personal. Risk is contextual. Risk is based on your life experiences. Um, you know, what, how, where you grew up, how you grew up, uh, the, the, the makeup of your family and community all play into how you view risk, which is why those meetings are so much fun trying to get everybody on the same page. I think with, with the AI, we're going to see something similar. I think it's people's view of it, how intelligent they think it is, how close to sentient they think it is. Uh, I think is going to be driven, you know, kind of by their their knowledge level, their their exposure. The tipping point will be when Dyson releases its domestic robot. I think that paired with AI um, causes a a fundamental shift in in what it means to be a human. So it, it's not just what is AI, but I think we have to all kind of circle around the campfire and say, are we good with what we've got now? Are we happy with the way we behave towards each other on Twitter? We go with that. We want to keep going. Are we okay with letting machines make certain decisions and not knowing why or how they arrived at that conclusion? And I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer, but I do think it is a larger societal conversation. And if we don't have it, then the lobbyists will ensure that we never have it. And, and the big will get bigger. Uh, and, and we saw that happen throughout the pandemic as well. You know, big shift to cloud. Uh, and I love cloud but the cloud goes down. And I say all that to say, whether it's AI, whether it's quantum, whether it's the next state of the art thing, none of us can imagine. The fundamental foundations of a continuous risk management approach of contextualizing the risk into the things that matter to the person or the entity affected by the risk. That I think still remains something that the AI is not gonna do very well, um, that, that is gonna be a human thing, I just don't think there's enough of us asking the questions now before this gets out of the bag. You know, we could have, if we had asked better questions in the early 90s, we probably could have avoided this whole ransomware nightmare. But we were in a rush to sell, 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 grow, grow, grow. And I, and I see that happening again. And, and it worries me because what happens when the my AI holds a different AI hostage? Just, Who do you call that? <laughs> you know, you talked about the manipulation piece and human, we know humans are fallible, right? At the end of the day. And I think to me, in most walks of life, control is evident, right? We, we see it, right? And, and you, you talked a little bit about it is, it is, this is nothing new, you know, in some, some parts of the globe, money, Right. In other words, it's, but in money is a, it is a mechanism of control, right? Like at the end of the day. And I think this is the thing where, you know, you had opened up and you were talking about the opportunities for education to really maybe embrace this and everything. And again, because it, to your point, at least here in the United States, education strategy hasn't been turned on its head in a long time. We are long overdue to turn it on its head. And I fear that that ship has already sailed because we have been putting scores of people through teacher certification programs who beyond cursory use of technology at home, they were thrust into this in a sink or swim type environment during the pandemic. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been like widespread calls to do um, some of what they, what I believe they did out in the um, uh, North, I think it was North Dakota, their uh, K-20W mm -hmm. program. Right? It was a public private partnership. They got, you know, and, and it was, gr it was a great test program that I would love to see replicated across because it, 
it baked into the technology, right? Got the use of it. And then they ultimately adjusted academic standards mm -hmm. to that, right? Then it was, hey, you know, teachers need to have X, Y, and Z. Because without doing that, then we know that there's strongholds in allowing industry people who are retired to the actually cross over. There's just a lot, mm -hmm. there's a lot of red tape that is in there. Um, but, you know, when we talk about manipulation, we, we obviously, we have to talk about social media, right? Like, mm -hmm. let, let's just go there. Like, so I know that we don't have much time left, but for the, our remaining moments here, let, let's talk about and I and I'll gladly toss it out there. Let's talk about TikTok in particular. However, acknowledge that all social media, and we're seeing an increasing call even from 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 some, the scientific community on the impact it's having on our youth. So, from your perspective, you know your insights, the walk of life, the, the role that you play in this. What's the biggest risk with that right now? So TikTok specifically is the biggest risk is that it is completely owned and controlled by a hostile foreign nation to the United States, a hostile foreign nation to a lot of countries. They don't mince any words about that. They're very open about that. Uh, and we, uh, some, some uh, friends of mine put together a mind map. We helped kind of publish that out and get in front of some state leaders uh, that showed that the app, and this is true for all apps, by the way, but we map TikTok is accessing vast amounts of information from the phone, not relevant to the use of the app. And I would suspect uh, that the majority of the apps you're using are doing some kind of overreach, some kind of uh, location, you know, I turned off location tracking, but when I updated it, turned back on. Um, the, that's the bigger risk is that, that the, the deeper into your life, because you trust your phone, and I think that's something we need to, we got to confront that. We have an uncomfortable trust relationship with our phone. Our phone goes to places our spouse doesn't, right? We take that thing into the restroom. It's in bed with us. And, and what happens, I think, I'm not a psychologist, but it's my theory. We don't see the digital risk for what it is. TikTok's entertaining. I, I for a very brief time, when it first came out, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I realized why it was TikTok because it was eating up all of my time because um, it was it, it was learning me. It was, hey, he likes that. He laughs at that. Let's feed him more of that. If you were to look at the TikTok feed in China, you would see science, math, engineering, uh, celebration of, of knowledge, of value, of, of community support and help. The average TikTok feed in America, not that. This is forcing a bigger conversation, which is, your phone isn't a toy. Your phone can hurt other people and you probably don't know that. So back to, it's a societal thing, right? Now, the advice I give everybody, delete it, delete it now. Uh, and before you make your kids delete it, be prepared uh, that that might not be as easy as just take it away. Uh, American uh, Pediatric Association did a study, I forget the specifics, but basically that, um, the use of the cell phone over a prolonged period of time creates the same addiction receptors and, and needs and cravings uh, uh, that heroin does. And so when you remove the phone and any of you have a teenager, if you've ever tried to take the phone away as punishment and they are like, I'm dying, turns out there might be some science behind that. So then we have to ask ourselves if the Surgeon General now says 13 is not old enough to be on social media, we need to start thinking about that. There will be another TikTok. We can get rid of this one. There'll be another one. There was one before TikTok. It's called Facebook, and a lot of you are still on it. If you haven't watched a documentary uh, on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, I encourage you to do so. The engineers of TikTok describe in great detail how they used a form of machine learning to optimize, weaponize, and ultimately promote to you negative content because human beings engage more frequently and for longer periods of time when they're upset about something than when they're happy. And so Facebook actually figured out a way to monetize this. Their entire feed model is based on it. TikTok took it to that next level. Um, I don't know what comes after it, but, but that train isn't going to stop. So if you don't know what it does, probably don't install it, right? Um, 
things come in pretty wrappers that aren't always good for us. Uh, and the problem is, is the majority of the populace doesn't know how tech works. So trying to have a conversation about what an app might be doing or not doing can be really hard. Uh, I find that when I take the tech out of the conversation and I, and I ask a simple question of any parent with a, with a minor child who has a smartphone, if that parent lets their child take the phone into their bedroom at night, I ask them a simple question. Are you comfortable with a random 40, 50 year old man walking off the street into your daughter's bedroom? And if you're not okay with that, don't let her have her phone in there because you just invited an entire world full of that into her bedroom. So I think it's, it's part parenting, it's part society. And lastly, I'll say this, uh, and, and a lot of people won't like this, it's a very unpopular opinion, uh, but we need to hold our technology manufacturers to a safety standard similar to nuclear reactors. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said there, right? And I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to come across as the alarmist, but it's like there are there's so many risks that are out there. A few weeks back, uh, myself and a colleague, actually, we briefed our state of, uh, state of privacy report. And there was a question that came across that we didn't have time to answer. And, and an individual was like, do you ever think the U.S. will have any meaningful privacy laws? And I'd say no, like we, it, it, as it stands today, data is, is, is the new gold, right? Like there are far too many people that are getting, uh, they're getting very wealthy off of it. But to your point, like all of the sensors, all of the stuff that we were using and, and as consumers, we're still driving that market to deliver. So until there's a full blown just upheaval in, in, in people, the consumers to stop buying the refrigerator that has Alexa built into it or the coffee maker, you know, you, it doesn't matter, right? Like at the end of the day, because all of those things are data points that are really just speaking to the essence of us, everything we do subconsciously. Um, the last point I would make there, you know, you talk about the apps in general. You're absolutely right. I wholeheartedly agree. Like today, yeah, TikTok's in the news, right? I, I, we get it. That's the big one. Um, social media, largely, I think we've understood that there's risks there. And in, in the fact that the Surgeon General finally came out, I think is big. Um, whether or not that's enough to sway a movement, I don't know. Like at the end of the day, like to your point, like there is legitimate psychological uh, impairment with with these devices. It, you know, all we've done is really change the marketing. People have known how to dissuade us to purchase products since the beginning of time. And now it's just made it a little easier. I think what's concerning though is that when you talk about holding the safety standard, I think that also is the, is, is getting us to a more simplified version of just a yes or no. Um, mm -hmm. Are you asking for more permissions than you need, right? Because all of these end user agreements, people aren't reading it. It's like you need, and they're, too, they're written in legalese. Nobody mm -hmm. cares. We're just hitting yes, right? Like at the end of the day, and even if you are, aren't okay with it, if you just determine, hey, I need to check it out or whatnot, there's no recourse either to go back on the individual. Like I don't understand why that is, you know, I, I get it to manage the functionality of the app at the end of the day, because you'd probably break it if you, if you allowed people to self-select what you're not going to give. Right. Um, but we've allowed free range. Well, and, and part of that is we have a addiction to free. True. Okay. There is no free, no free lunch, no free sandwiches. No. And, and even to the point where security studio provides, and we are no longer going to use that word, uh, community give back risk assessment for at home use as to me, we don't charge for it. Not because it, uh, because we do anything with the data, we just saw a lot of families didn't have access to, to some help. Uh, and we found that if we gave them a, a credit score like security score and some really, you know, human words about like, hey, maybe move the family photos onto a thumb drive off of the laptop, that we actually saw an improvement in the workplace uh, in cyber awareness uh, by shifting the focus away from a have to do to a want to do. But that's that 
that's a that's a uh, that takes time um i think you know the 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 addiction to the free to the to the i'm not going to read it it's i don't i don't know what happened but at some point in the last 10 15 years we lost our way of accountability we lost our way of of skepticism healthy skepticism i mean take any one of the phishing emails that's been successful in the last year read it out loud pretend the person's at your front door and nobody would fall for it so I do think we have to confront this. And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close this out with this. For any of you that are interested in where do we go from here, I encourage you to start researching cyber psychology. Cyber psychology is the intersection of what I've previously described as your analog human. So your, your analog OS, that fleshy, gooey, blood-powered, heartbeat-powered thing that you are, and this digital life that we live. Uh, very few of us in the in the Western modern world can effectively navigate a day without technology, either directly by us using it or embedded in the systems. I and mean, the the amount of critical infrastructure that is currently controlled by a ten year old OT, ras you know a, a Raspberry Pi and steroids, right? Uh, it's a lot. So I think I think it is it is time that we start to ask better questions. Uh, I think it's time that we start to to ask ourselves if we really need it. And I think one of the ways we as as risk assessors actually have a, a leading role in this conversation is by reengaging our businesses differently. Let's use these topics in a business context to foster dialogue that allows us to extend that conversation into the personal realm. Hey. And do you have children that are in athletics and this particular athletics app uh, had an issue? You might want to look at that. So I think I think it's it's on us. And I know nobody wants to hear that, but it's on us because we're the ones that are the purveyors and, and conveyors of what is a risk? What is the impact? How likely is it to occur? And I would say that the likelihood factor goes up every day. The impact factor goes up every day. Uh, and we are now at a point where our physical realm and our digital realm are essentially one and the same. And at the pace of the robotics uh, reaching, you know, via viable commercial availability um, with the, with the, with the, the chat bots and just all these different tech elements that, that they have the synthetic tissues. Now, I mean, it's just so much of this stuff. It's hard to keep up quantum. Um, that's all going to intersect. And, and when that does, if we have not at least had some basic conversations about this, if we if we haven't at least got some folks to start going, hmm, um, I don't know what it looks like, but we'll get a lot of really cool toys before anything bad happens. Ryan, listen, I, we're out of time. What an outstanding conversation. Truly exceeded my expectations. Uh, you know, Fortunately, like newsworthy events of late really allowed us to really, I think, contextualize the, the challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and provide our listeners with a means and, and some real life examples, right? To take back to their their organizations to start having some uh, some of these uh, necessary long overdue conversations, right? At the end of the day, you, you identify some of the benefits. Obviously, we, we talked a lot about the risk there. There is no free out there, right? Everything has a cost. So I want to thank you so much again for your time. I'm looking forward to us getting together again. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. You. This is great. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. I'm John Brandt. This is ISACA Podcast.